Hello, everyone, and uh, it's a pleasure to speak with you today from uh, ASCO in Chicago, 2017. Uh, my name is Neil Shore. I'm the medical director of Carolina Urologic Research Center in uh, South Carolina here in the United States. It's a great pr pleasure for me uh, to speak with my colleague and my good friend, Nick James, who's the professor of medical oncology at University of Birmingham in the UK. Uh, Nick has been really one of the all-time champions in prostate cancer research, uh, has just been a, a paragon of excellence in research and, and clinical excellence for not only clinicians in urology, medical oncology, radiation oncology, but quite frankly, in, in training programs around the world, and so much so based upon the data that you just keep churning out, thanks to the brilliance of the Stampede um, uh, collaborators. So here at ASCO today, we, we talked about uh, your um, presentation on the stampede arm for combining abiraterone acetate and, and prednisone. Maybe you want to just recap the, the, the essential key findings. We've talked about this, and there's yeah. archived uh, information on ecancer.org. But after you do that, I'd love for you to talk about the implications of the findings and how it's going to relate to future stampede trial arms. Mm -hmm. Sure. So, well, firstly, thank you for the introduction. Uh, the, so the data we presented was for men starting long-term hormone therapy for the first time. So this is, the, if you like, the core entry to the Stampede trial. So uh, we've had what you might call the sort of Frank Sinatra approach to trial inclusion, which is people do it their way. They decide that this person's going to get long-term hormone therapy, they can go in the trial. We have, of course, formalised that into T-stage bar but it's, that's fundamentally what we're looking at. And the hypothesis for testing is that if something works later, it'll work better earlier. And uh, in this case, it's abiraterone that we're testing. We've previously reported results on docetaxel, solidronic acid, and celecoxib. Uh, and what we saw was that shifting abiraterone into the newly diagnosed setting, starting long-term hormone therapy, has what I can only describe as spectacular impact on outcomes. So, when we set the trial up, we were targeting a 25% survival improvement, which we thought was reasonable and would certainly have been worth having. But what we saw was a nearly 40% improvement. And because, of course, there was the Latitude trial presented at the same time, uh, at the same meeting, um, showing an almost identical result, we can be very sure this is not a fluke. And, and, uh, and the trials were both consistent in terms of their effect on overall survival, failure-free survival, skeletal-related events and so on so big, big improvements in all of these things so uh, what was what surprised us was the magnitude of the change so it was the, the hazard ratio for failure free survival in stampede was 0.3 so a 70 percent improvement and that was consistent between the m0 50 percent of the patient population and the m1 so we, in fact in the m0s the, the hazard ratio for failure was 0.2 so an 80% reduction in failure at three years, which is just huge. So it meant that, for example, for patients having ADT plus radiotherapy in the M0 population, 25% of them had relapsed at three years, under 5% had relapsed. Um, and these are patients, things like enlarged pel pelvic lymph mm -hmm. nodes, high, big, high PSAs, high Gleason. So um, that's all very interesting. And of course, the metastatic results pretty much exactly mirror what Kareem presented in Latitude. And so, yeah, we think this should be practice changing. And we think it should change practice for M0 as well as M1. I mean, it obviously does raise all sorts of issues about funding and access and so on. But uh, we, we think a change of that magnitude, uh, we know if you relapse, you're going to die of prostate cancer. If you haven't relapsed, you may well not die of prostate cancer. No, that's extremely, that's a fantastic summary of a lot of yeah. data. Yeah. So um, it, it is, it's clearly going to be practice yeah. changing. The results yeah. are exceptionally profound. The tolerability and safety, uh, was, there were no new signals. In fact, it was remarkably well tolerated for a very long period of time taking yeah. uh, prednisolone, five milligrams daily, in addition yeah. to having the T levels lowered so yeah. so so significantly. And I'm sure you'll go have so much more data to go through later sure. on, trials that which you've accomplished. 
I always have so many more interesting things later on, quality of life, yeah. uh, health economic outcome reported data, and you and yes. I have talked about that. Sure. Many have asked, you know, how do we balance, you know, some of these different therapies and their yeah. implications, but you had mentioned to me earlier how the reduction in skeletal related events was so profound, and that's a big economic generator when For you sure. can drop that. So yeah. maybe that balances off some of the costs as well. Absolutely. So we've just done the health economic analysis for the dose of Taxol data we presented here two years ago. And the, the striking thing about that is that we worked with NICE, which is the UK mm -hmm. uh, body that looks at these things. And they, they got moderately excited about the survival benefit, but it was sort of, oh no, so we have to pay for something extra to make yeah. people live a bit longer with advanced cancer. And this is kind of a recurring theme and it's a problem. The thing they got really excited about in the, with the dose of Taxol data was the 40% SRE reduction, because they were saying this is money we never have to spend. This isn't extra money, this is money saved. And it, it turned out that that wiped out almost all the costs of giving those tax. We, we've just done the, the analysis, we haven't published it yet. So we've, we're seeing a bigger effect on skeletal related events with abiraterone. So although the drug is more expensive, the savings look like they might be bigger. So I think the health economics is going to be more challenging, I'm sure. It's a more expensive agent than docetaxel and you've got more clinic visits and so on, but the, the benefits are very large. So I think, I think it will turn out to be cost effective. No, I think you're spot on. I think these yeah. are really important ways that we as cancer researchers are kind yeah. of understanding what our health policy people want to see. Sure. And to your point, if you can cut down on orthopedic surgical interventions, cord yeah. compression, the need yeah. for more palliative radiation for pain, yeah. uh, tr uh, visits to the emergency department, hospitalization, these are massive cost reductions to any healthcare system. Absolutely. But let's kind of move on now, Nick. It's just, um, it really is, uh, again, I can't compliment you enough what you're doing in, in the, the collaboration, which is Stampede yeah. and all the folks within the UK and in Switzerland yeah. who've given the world this incredible amount of data to help change practice. So now with the, the learnings of this most recent yeah. arm, yeah. Uh, how is that going to inform you and your committee that is overseeing future trials? So what we did with docetaxel uh, two years ago was that we amended the protocol to permit upfront docetaxel as one of the part of the backbone of care that we were then adding to. And, uh, and then we just stratified the randomization so that we have equal numbers of docetaxel patients across whatever arms are recruiting. So we will do exactly the same with abiraterone. We will amend the protocol to permit up so upfront use of abiraterone or docetaxel, not both and stratify the randomization. So in the immediate future, we don't envisage much switching from docetaxel to abiraterone because of the reimbursement and the license. But we anticipate that with docetaxel, that took about six months to get it into the NHS England commissioning guidance. So we, we expect, given the magnitude effect, that we may well be able to nail this down in about six months. So from that point onwards, uh, what I suspect we'll see is largely a switch towards abiraterone over docetaxel um, if, if people have the choice. It is possible, because docetaxel is cheaper, that we'll be pushed down the route of carrying on using docetaxel because probably the survival benefit is of a similar order of magnitude. But whatever happens, we, the trial design kind of incorporates this in the, in the stratified randomization. Uh, and, um, uh, so, uh, so that's in principle how we'll deal with it, and it's worked very well with dose tax. It's also worked very well with radiotherapy because for node positive patients, we some patients do, and sometimes they don't get radical radiotherapy of their pelvic nodes. And again, we've stratified bias, and we'll be presenting more data on the interaction between radiotherapy, abiraterone, and dose tax at future meetings. Mm -hmm. Um, in terms of future and current arms, we have two more sets of results due to come out. We have, uh, we'd already recruited out over 2,000 men to a randomization for metastatic disease to radical radiotherapy to the prostate. So that's, and a lot of those patients were getting docetaxel as well. So we've, that'll be very interesting. We hope to be, that will be mature next year. The year after, we've also recruited out a further 2,000 men to a randomization uh, to abiraterone plus enzalutamide together as a combination therapy. And again, we have some docetaxel use in that arm as well. And uh, we anticipate that we should have mature results, survival results in two years' time for that. We've just added to the trial the diabetes drug metformin for the non-diabetic patients going in. So this mm -hmm. is... is uh, 
potentially very interesting. We have two sets of things we're interested in with that. Um, uh, because there's a lot of epidemiological data suggesting metformin makes diabetics, gives diabetics a better outcome than other anti-diabetic therapies, we thought it was worth testing in a non-diabetic population. And, uh, but the second thing we've tested is that, of course, we, uh, hormone therapy has all sorts of adverse effects on bone, uh, diabetes risk, fat accumulation and so on. And we hypothesized that metformin may actually ameliorate some of the toxicity of ADT. So even if we don't affect survival, we think we may actually affect things like weight gain, which is a big problem for a lot of men on ADT. So we, we'll see. And, um, and then we've got a, two further interesting methodological things in lining up as well. So in the UK, there's been a second trial recruiting in the same population as Stampede, looking at oestrogen patches as an alternative way of ADT. The hypothesis being that a lot of the toxicity of ADT is actually oestrogen deprivation. And so that trial has been recruiting well and it's met a lot of its endpoints so far. It's, we want to expand it to a phase three trial, but it suffers by competing with Stampede. So it's taking a long time to recruit. So we're going to add a, an oestrogen patch arm to Stampede, knowing that we will never power the analysis within Stampede. But the intention is that we will be able to do a pooled meta-analysis with the patch trial oestrogen patch patients and the Stampede oestrogen patch patients. The result of that is that instead of patch reporting in 2023, it'll report in 2021. So it, it, it's, it'll bring forward the reporting time at virtually no cost because the trial already had ethics approval, it's all running and so on. So that seemed to be a win all round. And so that's a sort of, if you like, a statistical development. But I think it sets a model for how you could do international collaborations in the future. And instead of setting up a, a trial in multiple countries, you set up multiple trials in multiple countries and pool the data. You avoid a whole load of cross-border regulatory issues by doing that. Um, the second thing we're about to add is, uh, is a PARP inhibitor. So there's obviously a lot of data emerging around DNA repair deficits predisposing to a good response to PARP inhibition. We've pulled out um, a proportion of our blocks and the sort of core abnormalities, the BRCA ones, are present in about 5%, maybe slightly fewer patients. There's then a hinterland of BRCA-like related things that also appear to give you sufficient sensitivity to PARP inhibitors that we maybe can bump the, the eligible proportion up somewhere between 15 and 20%. It depends where we want to draw the boundary. And so we're just setting up the infrastructure to do upfront sequencing of newly diagnosed patients with metastatic disease, this is tumour sequencing, and uh, we'll randomise eligible patients between standard of care, whatever that happens to be, dose tax, laboratory, ADT, and the same care plus the PARP inhibitor. So we hope to go live with randomization to that in the autumn. We've, we're just battling our way through some of the logistic issues around how we get the sequencing done in a timely fashion. So that's fantastic. I mean, the, uh, the metformin trial, which potentially uh, would improve quality of life parameters, yeah. the, uh, 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 the transdermal estrogen, which yeah. because it's transdermal and not uh, uh, given, um, you know, in the previous historic yeah. oral form, so, potentially cuts down on VTE, thromboembolism, cardiovascular does. toxicity, does. and again improves quality of life. Yeah. I think that's fantastic. And then, of course, the PARPs, as you're alluding yeah. to, yeah. Uh, an explosion of different PARP trials out there. Yeah. And I can't think of a better uh, organization uh, of collaborators to get this done in, 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 in a timely way for yeah. the benefit of patient care. Yeah. You know, I love your idea and your notion about international cooperative groups. We need to do so much yeah. more of that. You know, we talk about siloing governments, universities, communities, specialties, yeah. but countries and trialists, uh, yeah. can, we, could, we can do better. Yeah, uh, and no one better than you to, to lead that charge. <laughs> no pressure, though. You know. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. So um, uh, it's great. Any other uh, thoughts regarding uh, your experience here at ASCO this year? So I think there's, a, there's a, a couple of other things that we're, we're doing within Stampede, which obviously emerging themes more generally. So circulating tumour DNA is obviously a very hot topic, not just in prostate, but everywhere. So we, we have a circulating tumour DNA collection going on within the Aberatra and Enzalutamide and parallel control patients. So we're taking sequential samples. So one of the things we're going to be looking at is, for example, can we see AR mutation transcripts rising as the aberratra and enzalutamide resistance kicks in and how does changes, how do changes in that correlate with the response? So uh, Gert Attard is leading both the Abienza arm and that sub-study. 
And we have a second uh, sort of linked translational programme, which uh, we've called Stratosphere. And we've just got funding of uh, a large sum of funding from Prostate Cancer UK. So we're going to start pulling out a lot on a large scale. We've just pulled out 500 blocks. We've got potentially 9,000 we can get our hands on uh, with a view to doing DNA, RNA and protein analysis on the blocks. So we, we've, we've got a very exciting resource to deal with. Yeah. That's, a, that's outstanding, and, and Gerd yeah. is just uh, exceptional in his yeah, ability to sort yeah. through all this. He's done incredible contributions. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, and thanks for everything you've done, and yeah. uh, look forward to seeing you at future meetings. <laughs> and yeah. uh, thank you all for uh, taking the time and, and listening.